Hello, thank you for joining me today. I'm Linda Lamp here, and we've been reading A Course in Miracles. Today, we're going to start on chapter 23 in the main text, The War Against Yourself. And I believe what we'll do is we'll read the introduction, section one, and also section two, the irreconcilable beliefs. So let's get started. The War Against Yourself, introduction. Do you not see the opposite of frailty and weakness in sinlessness? Innocence is strength and nothing else is strong. The sinless cannot fear for sin of any kind is weakness. The show of strength attack would use to cover frailty conceals it not. For how can the unreal be hidden? No one is strong who has an enemy and no one can attack unless he thinks he has. Belief in enemies is therefore the belief in weakness and what is weak will not be the will of God. Being opposed to it, it is God's enemy and God is feared as an opposing will. How strange indeed becomes this war against yourself. You will believe that everything you use for sin can hurt you and become your enemy, and you will fight against it and try to weaken it because of this, and you will think that you succeeded and attack again. It is as certain you will fear what you attack as it is sure that you will love what you perceive as sinless. He walks in peace who travels sinlessly along the way love shows him. For love walks with him there, protecting him from fear, and he will only see the sinless who cannot attack. Walk you in glory with your head held high and fear no evil. The innocent are safe because they share their innocence. Nothing they see is harmful for their awareness of the truth releases everything from the illusion of harmfulness. And what seemed harmful now, now stands shining in their innocence, released from sin and fear and happily returned to love. They share the strength of love because they look on innocence and every error disappeared because they saw it not. Who looks for glory finds it where it is. Where could it be but in the innocent? Let not the little interferers pull you to littleness. There can be no attraction of guilt in innocence. Think what a happy world you walk with truth beside you. Do not give up this world of freedom for a little sigh of seeming sin, nor for a tiny stirring of guilt's attraction. Would you, for all these meaningless distractions, lay heaven aside? Your destiny and purpose are far beyond them in the clean place where littleness does not exist. Your purpose is at variance with littleness of any kind, and so it is at variance with sin. Let us not be littleness Sorry, let us not let littleness lead God's son into temptation. His glory is beyond it, measureless and timeless as eternity. Do not let time intrude upon your sight of him. Leave him not frightened and alone in his temptation, but help him rise above it and perceive the light of which he is a part. Your innocence will light the way to his and so is yours protected and kept in your awareness. For who can know his glory and perceive the little and the weak about him? Who can walk trembling in a fearful world and realize that heaven's glory shines on him? Nothing around you but is part of you. Look on it lovingly and see the light of heaven in it so will you come to understand all that is given you. 
In kind forgiveness will the world sparkle and shine, and everything you once thought sinful now will be reinterpreted as part of heaven. How beautiful it is to walk clean and redeemed and happy through a world in bitter need of redemption that your innocence bestows upon it. What can you value more than this? Here is your salvation and your freedom, and it must be complete if you would recognize it. All right, now let's move on to chapter 23, The War Against Yourself, Section 2, Irreconcilable Beliefs. The memory of God comes to the quiet mind. It cannot come where there is conflict, for a mind at war against itself remembers not eternal greatness, gentleness, rather. The means of war are not the means of peace, and what the warlike would remember is not love. War is impossible unless belief in victory is cherished. Conflict within you must imply that you believe the ego has the power to be victorious. Why else would you identify with it? Surely you realize the ego is at war with God. Certain it has no enemy. Yet just as certain is its fixed belief, it has an enemy that it must overcome and will succeed. Do you not realize a war against yourself would be a war on God? Is victory conceivable? And if it were, is this victory that you would want? The death of God, if it were possible, would be your death. Is this victory? The ego always marches to defeat because it thinks that triumph over you is possible. And God thinks otherwise. This is no war, only the mad belief that the will of God can be attacked and overthrown. You may identify with this belief, but never will it be more than madness. As fear will rein in madness and will seem to have placed, replaced love there. This is the conflict's purpose. And to those who think that it is possible, the means seem real. Be certain that it is impossible. God and the ego or yourself and it will ever meet. You seem to meet and make your strange alliances on grounds that have no meaning. For your beliefs converge upon the bodies, the ego's chosen home, which you believe is yours. You meet at a mistake, an error in your self-appraisal. The ego joins with an illusion of yourself you share with it. Yet illusions cannot join. They are the same and they are nothing. Their joining lies in nothingness. Two are as meaningless as one or as a thousand. The ego joins with nothing, being nothing. The victory it seeks is meaningless in itself. Sorry. The victory it seeks is meaningless as is itself. Brother, the war against yourself is almost over. The journey's end is at the place of peace. Would you not now accept the peace offered you here? This enemy you forgot as an intruder on your peace is here transformed before your sight into the giver of your peace. Your enemy was God himself, to whom all conflict, triumph, and attack of any kind are all unknown. He loves you perfectly, completely, eternally. The Son of God at war with his creator is a condition as ridiculous as nature roaring at the wind in anger, proclaiming it is part of itself no more. Could nature possibly establish this and make it true? Nor is it up to you to say what shall be part of you and what is kept apart. The war against yourself was undertaken to teach the Son of God that he is not himself 
and not his father's son. For this, the memory of his father must be forgotten. It is forgotten in the body's life, and if you think you are a body, you will believe you have forgotten it. Yet truth can never be forgotten by itself, and you have not forgotten what you are, only a strange illusion of yourself. A wish to triumph over what you are remembers not. The war against yourself is but the battle of two illusions, struggling to make them different from each other in the belief that one conquers will be true, that what one conquers will be true. There is no conflict between them and the truth, nor are they different from each other. Both are not true. And so it matters not from what form they take. What made them is insane and they remain a part of what made them. Madness holds no menace to reality and has no influence upon it. Illusions cannot triumph over truth, nor can they threaten it in any way. And the reality that they deny is not a part of them. What you remember is a part of you, for you must be as God created you. Truth does not fight against illusions, nor do illusions fight against truth. Illusions only battle with themselves. Being fragmented, they fragment. But truth is indivisible and far beyond their little reach. You will remember what you know when you have learned you cannot be in conflict. One illusion about yourself can battle with another, yet the war of two illusions is a state where nothing happens. There is no victor and there is no victory. And truth remains radiant, apart from conflict, untouched and quiet in the peace of God. Conflict must be between two forces. It cannot exist between one power and nothingness. There is nothing you could attack that is not part of you. And by attacking it, you make two illusions of yourself in conflict with each other. And this occurs whenever you look on anything that God created with anything but love. Conflict is real, for it is the birth of fear. Yet what is born of nothing cannot win reality through battle. Why would you fill your world with conflicts with yourself? Let all this madness be done for you and turn in peace to the remembrance of God still shining in your quiet mind. See how the conflict of illusions disappears when it is brought to truth. For it seems real only as long as it is seen as war between conflicting truths. The conqueror, to be the truer, the more real, and the vanquisher of the illusion that was less real, made an illusion by defeat. Thus, conflict is the choice between illusions. One to be crowned as real, the other vanquished and despised. Here will the father never be remembered. Yet no illusion can invade his home and drive him out of what he loves forever. And what he loves forever quiet and at peace because it is his home. You who are beloved of him are no illusion, true, being as true and holy as himself. The stillness of your certainty of him and of yourself is home to both of you who dwell as one and not apart. Open the door of his most holy home and let forgiveness sweep away all trace of the belief in sin that keeps God homeless and his son with him. You are not a stranger in the house of God. Welcome your brother to the home where God has set him in serenity and peace and dwells with him. Illusions have no place where love abides, protecting you from everything that is not true. You dwell in peace as a limitless carrot as its creator, and everything is given those who would remember him. Over his home, the Holy Spirit watches, sure that its peace can never be disturbed. How can the resting place of God 
turn on itself and seek to overcome the one who dwells there. And think what happens when the house of God perceives itself divided. The altar disappears, the light grows dim, the temple of the Holy One becomes a house of sin, and nothing is remembered except illusions. Illusions can conflict because their forms are different, and they do battle only to establish which form is true. Sorry about that. Illusion meets illusion. Truth itself. The meeting of illusions leads to war. Peace, looking on itself, extends itself. War is the condition in which fear is born and grows and seeks to dominate. Peace is the state where love abides and seeks to share itself. Conflict and peace are opposites. Where one abides, the other cannot be. Where either goes, the other disappears. So is the memory of God obscured in minds that have become illusions battleground. Yet far beyond this senseless war, it shines, ready to be remembered when you side with peace. So a lot of words here, lots and lots of words here. Let me go back to, uh, I think it was in the introduction. where it talks about the ego. And I just want to revisit that teaching again, because it's so important to understand what the ego is. And if you've followed my teachings, this will be a review. But if you've, uh, if you've joined us new, um, this may be surprising to you. But your housing, the body within, within, within which your spirit resides, is equipped with various wiring, coping mechanisms. And one of those mechanisms is the ego. And the ego, as, a, as it functions as a part of the body, and this is not the Freudian ego that you hear about. This is, uh, this is the physical ego, the actual physical wiring of the housing. Uh, Freud's ego is likely the same, but it's, it, he's, he's looking at it merely from a psychological point of view. And it's a very physical thing. The, the ego in our housing is a very physical thing. It's what's responsible for our, our physical responses to things. Goodness, what a busy day with the phones. So sorry about that as well. Um, for those of you that don't know, I operate a lodging business. And so now it is spring and the lodging business is much busier. So I always try to get these phones quieted down and pick a time when we won't be interrupted. Clearly that didn't work today. So I apologize for the interruptions. But in any case, back to what I was saying, the ego is the wiring of your housing. And for example, it's wired for freeze, fight and flight. Those are automated responses within your housing. And so when you want, when you feel the need to argue with someone or to fight with someone or to flee a situation or to freeze, be, be, become paralyzed in, in, an, in, an, in an inability to either make a decision or to move, all of these are functions of the ego. And so, this is where it's talking about the ego in your in in this lesson that is what it's talking about that is the function that's happening there um i've been scrolling through this section and i'm for some reason having a hard time landing on uh Now there's something here towards the end of the introduction that says nothing around you is but a part of you. And um, th this 
remark ties into the way this whole book has been written. It's archaic language and it's not always easy to understand what it what it's saying. I believe that what it's trying to say here is that everything around you is a part of you because we are all one. We are one with everything that's here. There is just one fabric here. There is just one substance and that substance is, is very slight substance and energy. It's mostly energy. So it goes on to say, look on it lovingly and see the light of heaven in it. So you will come to understand that all is given you. Everything around you is a part of this fabric that is here to support us and here to uh, help us in our experience of this third dimension that we've come here to be a part of. Um, do you read, do, and again, and now I'm into the next section, the irreconcilable beliefs, the second paragraph. Do you not realize a war against yourself would be a war on God? So I, I really, I wish that this, this book had been written simply in a positive uh, frame as opposed to these negative questions. But in essence, that is what you're doing. When you, when you war with yourself, then you're at war with everything, including divinity, because you are an individuated aspect of divinity. So there is no death to God. If there were death to God, there would be death to everything. The entire, everything would, would cease. And I don't see how that's even a, a possibility. The, the uh, second full, the first full page of this text in the uh, irreconcilable belief section it reads, be certain that it is impossible, the ego, the God and the ego or yourself and it will ever meet. You seem to make and make your strange alliances on grounds that have no meaning. For your beliefs converge on the body, the ego's chosen home for which you believe is yours. You, may, you meet at a mistake, an error in your self-appraisal. The ego joins with an illusion of yourself you share with it and yet illusions cannot join. They are the same and they are nothing. Their joining lies in nothingness. The two are as meaningless as one or a thousand. The ego joins with nothing being nothing. The victory it seeks is meaningless as itself. I have just a little bit of a trouble with this because the ego isn't nothing. The ego is a function of our housing. It's a function of our body. It's not nothing. And in fact, our lives are so driven and controlled by our ego so often when we are living in an unconscious way that I would go far, so far as saying not, not only is it not nothing, but it's something because you've, we make it that, we give it power. Perhaps in and of itself, it's nothing. But that to me would mean that we're saying the housing is nothing and the housing is not nothing. The housing is something to be honored while we're inhabiting it. We need to make peace with our housing. We need to understand our housing. And I think some of this teaching is just beyond the realm of what is contained within the Courts and Miracles. So I hope you had a uh, good day with this. Uh, I hope it's helpful information for you and that you've enjoyed the reading. If there is anything that I can do to assist, you can text me at 907-351-3003. You could leave a voicemail as well. Chances are you won't catch me if you call, but um, I do want you to um, text me if you have questions or would like support. Please reach out. You can also visit me on the website, lindalamp.shop, lindalamp.com, and of course, Facebook, YouTube as well.
Thank you again for joining me today. Namaste and much love.